Yo V aus Berlin. Hi, my name is Matthias Willich and today I'd like to talk to you about how to manage the transition to PI group leader or faculty. Now there are some uh, fairly obvious points that I think um, will be immediately apparent. So of course at the beginning of your transition to a group leader, whatever it is, whatever setting, assistant professor or um, PI at a research institution, um, of course you need to set up shop, you need to um, order equipment and uh, you need to keep your productivity up and need to write grants and all that. So that I basically take that for granted. But Beyond that, what are important pieces of advice? This is what I'd like to talk about here. And my very first um, advice, piece of advice, I think is the, um, I think is maybe also the most important one, is resist the urge to fill positions if you're not completely convinced of the candidate. I mean, I think that cannot be overemphasized how important that is. These first people that you recruit to your lab they will be decisive for, you, for the initial success of your lab. So if you have some doubt about somebody, um, and I know this is much harder <laughs> than, it, than it sounds, then keep that position open, vacant, don't fill it. Wait until you have somebody that you are really convinced of. This is really hard to do, I know, uh, from my own experience as well, because, you know, when you want to start up your lab, you need to hire people, you need to bring people in to get it all going. Um, but, you know, there's many stories I know from several labs where by not hiring the right people, you can set yourself back far more than waiting maybe, I don't know, a couple months, half a year or something until you find the right person. And the right person, I don't just mean in terms of skill set, of course, that's also important, but I also mean in terms of personality. Because that um, the initial people that you hire, they will, they will also con contribute to setting the tone for your lab and the dynamics in your lab group. So it is just really important to get that right. And so have the courage to keep some positions vacant and not fill them right away. This is much easier to do when you're a more established lab. Uh, you can keep positions open for some period of time. Uh, it isn't really hard to do when you're starting out. I know this, but I think this is also very important advice. Get those first hires right and um, have the courage to wait. Second point of advice is you will be busy, of course, um, but don't forget get to also invest in your professional network because your professional network will be so important to your success. It will be the source of um, productivity publications, maybe uh, joint grants. So it, it's easy to get overwhelmed in the beginning. Um, don't make that be at the cost of your professional network. Your professional network is uh, extremely precious. And every minute you invest in it will be worth it. I guarantee that. So um, don't forget your professional network. Um, invest in the, in the links that you already have and invest in making more links. The third piece of advice is invest also in personal relationships in your new department or uh, research area, whatever it may be. Um, don't just look inward. Um, um, go to meetings, um, build networks and friendships, because these are the people that, depending on your system, they will be important for, you know, granting tenure or reviewing your tenure package, um, depending on how that's organized in your institution. Uh, but they will also be involved in decisions that may affect you or, or your, your lab's operation by setting local policy. And it's good to um, just not be... Um, inward oriented and to start making these networks and beyond just these departmental decisions that could affect you in, in various ways um, there can also be some unexpected links really by talking to people that don't do what you do but they're in generally the same vicinity of the area of science like a biology department or something that can be that can be really good links and um, 
uh, discoveries that arise from uh, making these connections with your immediate colleagues in, in your department. Now, having said that, um, there is always a temptation to go very broad, um, especially for the type of person that's... Um, I, I tend to get very easily interested in things and I actually have maybe a hard time focusing on, on particular things. Um, I have a low threshold for excitement and many other people are like that. Uh, but resist the temptation to become too broad at first. Um, you can become broad later on, I think, much more comfortably when you have already established yourself in your field. But if you become too broad right away, I think you will have a harder time um, standing for something. I think it's just reality. I experienced that myself. I mean, uh, my lab in Berlin was very broad in the beginning. And um, while that's not a disadvantage now, it was definitely um, a disadvantage in, in the very beginning because you don't really stand for one thing. And when that happens, then you tend to get uh, maybe less invitations for uh, fewer invitations for seminars, or you tend to get invite, invited less to, to meetings. Uh, maybe you get also invited less as a as a cooperator in a particular grant because you know what do you really stand for because of your diffuse. So I think um, it is good advice in the beginning at least to establish yourself um, quite well um, in a particular fairly narrow topic. I did that in my beginning in in Montana. I focused on a particular topic quite well and um, that paid off. And um, when I restarted the lab basically in Berlin, I, I did not do that and the cost was felt in terms of um, what, I've just ex what I've just explained. So I think the advice that I would give to people definitely is when you start out your lab, focus on something that you, that you do really well, that you build your name, uh, that you stand for a particular topic, technique or whatever it is, and then take it from there once you are established. And, and these costs that I mentioned, they're not just um, superficial things like invitations to, to meetings or seminars, but it's also once you, you get too broad too quickly, I think you will have a harder time publishing because you will always break in, so to speak, into other people's area or fields where maybe you don't quite know the language as well. Uh, you might have a harder time getting grants because if your papers are too spread out over too many areas, you will have fewer that are directly relevant for the grant that you're writing right now by necessity, sheer mathematical necessity. Um, so I think that there's a bunch of areas beyond just this more vague, diffuse marker of, let's say, um, reputation in the field. There are some pretty hard um, criteria that will make it harder for you in terms of getting published and getting grants funded if you're too broad in the beginning. Another thing is like, of course, this is an exciting time. Uh, you get to set up your own lab. Also, this is your opportunity to set your lab culture. And, you know, you need to think about what kind of lab do you want to run? Um, what kind of PI are you going to be? And uh, because this becomes part of the DNA in your lab, uh, especially if you get buy-in from people. Um, so. It is worth thinking about and establishing from the very beginning the kind of lab that you would like to have. This could be all kinds of things. It could be uh, like how do you run lab meetings? How important are lab meetings to you? Um, how do you manage interactions with people? But um, yeah, just a million tiny things that make up the culture in the lab can also be fun things. And so I think um, it's important to, to just think about it. Some of these things just happen also over time and get contributed by people, which is also good. But um, you also get to set sort of the general tone and the general you know, attitude of the lab. So it's worth investing some time in that. Yeah, now the, the next advice, you know, may apply to you, especially if you're more at a, a more research intensive university. And that is rein in your time that you devote to teaching preparation. Um, teaching, you know, I, I like to do well, of course, uh, but teaching is also one of those bottomless pits. You, you can always do better. You can always make that one slide even better and you can spend endless amounts of time invested in your teaching. Often the rewards for doing very good teaching are minimal. I mean, there's obviously direct awards. You feel good about yourself and you connect with students and that's invaluable. Um, don't do it poor job teaching. 
Mm, but, um, you know, rein in the time you invest in that. It's, it's going to be super important because just at the beginning when you have to set up all these lectures and, and get all the material together, that, that can really easily eat up too much of your time. And so my advice is like do, do a good job with uh, setting up your, your classes and also your courses. Remember, you, can, you will teach them for 10, 20, 30 years and they get better over time because you have time every year to update them. You don't start from scratch then. You can, um, over time, you just always invest a bit of time. Also, as, as you're not teaching the class, you take notes and uh, keep them up to date. That's very important. I think it's valued also by, by many people. But in the beginning, you need to really rein in your investment. Otherwise, it just can be overwhelming. And of course, be prepared to learn. I mean, we are actually not very well prepared for the majority of the work that we do now. I, I for example, never received any formal training in teaching. I, I like it, but I never really received any formal training. I have for sure not gotten any input of any kind on how to manage people. It's, it's a fact, but um, ends up that's also what is a huge part of this job and how to also get, get a lab organized and all that. This is basically things that you learn. So at every one of these stages, you have to learn something. You have to learn something when you're um, a PhD student, you learn again when you're a postdoc, even you have just basically made it uh, to postdoc. And, and, and then of course you learn again because you have uh, just a broader set of responsibilities uh, when you're a PI group leader, assistant professor, whatever the case may be. And you just need to be prepared for that. I mean, it's um, not going to be the same as being a postdoc in all eternity. You have um, other responsibilities. It's different. And so be prepared to learn. I mean, of course, this um, was a lot to unpack here. Uh, don't forget that this is also one of the greatest moments um, when you get to set up your own lab. It, it's a lot of fun. It's exciting. It's the beginning of a whole lifetime of discovery and interacting with people, making friends, people that then leave your lab, start their own labs. You have your own international network of uh, collaborators. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. Um, so don't forget that this also should be and will be a lot of fun. But keep in mind these uh, pieces of advice. I think they will help you uh, get established and um, without a doubt this is also a stage that comes with its own challenges as well as opportunities. Hi there! If you like this video don't forget to click like down there and also remember to subscribe to the channel and feel free to leave comments. See ya!